computer, just letting you know that we are recording. Um, if you have questions during the course of this talk, which I'm sure you will, um, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat and we will um, have time at the end to answer any of those questions. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Dennis. Okay, thank you, Allie. Um, I, by looking at the names, I know a lot of people are, already know who I am. Um, but I'm Dennis Ferraro. I've been working for the university now 30 years. I'm a herpetologist and I've um, been working with the herpetofauna of the state of Nebraska for over 30 years. Um, and I'm very in, intent in getting conservation and data of all our herpetofauna. And I just want to thank Game and Parks Commission for everything they do to help me um, and help my students um, through the years and in the future so we can do the proper conservation of biodiversity in the state as well as the biodiversity of herbivora. fauna. Um, so I'm going to start by sharing my screen here just for a second. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see my screen and hear me properly. So this is part of the amphibian, uh, Nebraska Amphibian Monitoring, uh, which we've been doing for oh, over 10 years now. Um, it started as part of Frog Watch USA, but I broke off from them and more did our database and everything that we do pretty much specialized to Nebraska. Um, with the help of Game and Parks Commission and other entities. And you can see a lot of the sites in the state uh, that monitoring has been done on. And we're going to continue to do more and more monitoring of amphibians. Uh, so before we start, or as we're starting here, uh, just to make sure everybody's on the same page, what is an amphibian? Well, an amphibian is a order or a group or a taxa of vertebrate animals that has thin skin, they breathe and drink through the skin, they have no claws or scales, very few teeth if they have any teeth whatsoever, they do have true bones in the adult stage, uh, the replacement or macaulay bones which means they start out of cartilage and change to bones, a three chambered heart so the mixing of blood, uh, they are ectotherms, no they're not cold blooded, they are ectotherms, they're the same temperature as the water soil and atmosphere in which they live and that temperature varies with that atmosphere. Uh, they have a larval stage and then go through metamorphosis. We'll go a little deeper into that. They breed and deposit their eggs in a very water or aqueous linked area that could be a pond, it could be inside a bromeliad, it could be a small depression under a rock for some. Those in Nebraska, we're mainly talking about temporary ponds. Okay? And they have great adaptions and exceptions to almost all the rules. Like I can't say they have four appendages because there's a whole group of amphibians that has no appendages. Okay? I can't say that they have no teeth because there's some that do have teeth. And I can't say there's some that stay out of the water because there are some that stay out of the water and there's some that can't leave the water. So like any groups of animals, this is the generality. There are a lot of exceptions across the world. So what we, we're going to talk about mainly is two of the groups in the class amphibia, okay, two orders, two, two types of orders, and that's caudata or salamanders, and we have two species in the order Claudata in Nebraska, and it's about 350 of these uh, in the world, but they're all pretty much north of the equator, or whole Arctic. And just to go on with amphibians, we do have 11 inurins, which are frogs, and some people um, call them frogs and toads, but toads are nebulous, uh, just real quickly. 
This is our Great Plains toad. It's more terrestrial. And this is our narrowmouth toad found in Webster and Gage County, right here. It's less than an inch long. It's in the family of what we call microhylidae or mini tree frogs. It's smooth and it's called a toad. So the word toad doesn't really mean anything to a herpetologist. They're all inurins, okay? And again, we have 11 inurins in the state of Nebraska with about 3,500 worldwide. And they're both north and south of the equator. Some getting close to the Arctic Circle. Okay, let's first talk about their skin, or what we call integument. When it comes to amphibians, their, the organ, their biggest organ, their integument means everything. It drives their evolution, it drives their behavior, it makes an amphibian an amphibian. And it's where the amphibian meets the environment. And because they're a small creature, very slim lined, there's a big, what we call, surface to volume ratio, which means there's a lot of surface on this skin to the weight or volume of the animal. And their skin, okay, or integument for this whole class, all amphibians, is a semi-permeable membrane, which means water and ions or salts or chemicals can move across that. So it's not a real skin, it's a semi-permeable membrane that has more mucus glands in it to keep it wet than any other animal per square inch, okay? Twice or three times as many mucus glands as the next animal that has mucus glands in its dermis or skin. And its body is 70 to 80% water, which is a little more than most animals. Most animals are 60 to 70% water. Amphibians, all those in the class are 70 to 80% water. And some are aquatic, some are terrestrial, and some move back and forth between these two environments. When they do that, they have their skin has to adjust because if they jump into the water, the water would rush right into the body and blow them up and kill them, okay? If they came on land, all the water would rush out of their body if, they're, if their skin or integument didn't regulate that and they would dry up and desiccate. So they have a constant battle to keep themselves at the right water level, whether they're in the water or out of the water. And this is the biggest fight they have to stay alive. One thing to note, any amphibian out of water will continuously lose water through evaporation of their skin. Now, the rate of that loss would change if the humidity is 99%. But if they're not in standing water, they will always be losing a little water that they have to try to gain back or find a way to keep that. And here's one that when it starts to lose too much water, it jumps right back in the water. So this is a leopard frog. This happens to be the plains leopard frog. You can tell that just real quickly for you more advanced people. Right there is the break. Makes it a plains and not a northern. Um, and so when it starts to lose, it jumps into the water. So it always stays next to the water, this particular species. Other species that are more terrestrial, um, like our bufonids, which, which are things like the Great Plains toad, the stagefoot, or maybe the American toad, they have a thicker layer to keep the water in, so they carry water with them in urinary bladders, and lymph glands that are in this area. So what they do is they have an area here called the pelvic seat, which is very, has a bunch of capillaries in it. And they push this against the sand, which is wet, and they suck water up into their bladders and sacs. So they can carry that water with them to keep their body hydrated. Now when you pick these up, they get scared, and all the water in these sacs comes shooting out. Frogs, anurins do not urinate on you. They just expel the water they are carrying on you. That's all it is. It's not uric, it is just water, okay? Because their bladders are not connected to their kidneys, okay? They're actually on the sides. 
So unlike us, where it goes from kidney to bladder to out, in the class amphibia, it goes from kidneys straight out, and the bladders are just on the side to hold the water. Now, another thing these animals have is a very warty skin. Why do they have the warts? Well, if you think about it, when it's really hot out and they can get dry, what happens, they're underground and their body temperature is cooler than the air, okay? So at night or just before dawn, they will come up when the air is cool, okay, and their body is a little cooler, and the um, water in the air, because usually it's higher humidity in the summer, will form dew on their body. And when, the, and when these animals are up on an angle, all those little warts channel the water, the dew, down to this area where they're sitting and they can suck that dew right up into their glands, their uh, lymph glands or their bladders. Amazing. Because no amphibian can drink orally through their mouth. All amphibians have to take the water in through their skin. So you'll never see an amphibian going up to a water dish and drinking. It doesn't happen. They can jump in the water dish and drink but they can't drink with their mouth. So, as I was saying, their behavior makes them stay close to the water, mainly only be out at night or when it's raining, hide under things, and this is for salamanders and frogs and all amphibians, burrow down where it's cool and wet, or find a place, a microhabitat, like sand that they can pull the moist water out of. It's hard to pull moist water out of clay. You can easily pull moist water out of sand with your pelvic seat. So they prefer more sandy than clay. The other thing they do with their skin, we're still just talking about the skin, they breathe, okay? They put, bring oxygen into their body through their skin and they push out the CO2 expel CO2 through their skin. And they do this in several ways. One, just as it sits on the edge of their body that's wet with their mucus. The other way, they buccal pump. You ever see a salamander frog, the little throat going up and down? They're not breathing through lungs. They have no diaphragm. What they're doing, they're making the air flow around the body. And they're also making air going in and out of their mouth. And their mouth is like their skin and they're exchanging oxygen and CO2 through their skin. And we call that buccal pumping. Now, juveniles do have gills, as you can see with these salamander larvae, because they have external gills, and they do do some breathing with gills. And while some anurans, um, and very few salamanders or caudata, have lungs, the lungs don't function very well, okay? They're just there, and actually, Lungs in the neurons, just a little hint, I won't go too deep into it, evolved not for breathing, but for calling. So here's just a chart real quickly. We're still working on our bar tiger salamander. We, we did it. But you can see this bar, the, the clear bar means oxygen in. So right there, 30% is through the skin. Here's a bullfrog tadpole. 66% of the oxygen in is through the skin, and about 60% of the CO2. Adult bullfrog who has the best lungs, still, look at all that CO2. 80% of the CO2 goes out through the skin, and 20% of the oxygen goes in through the skin. Things like hellbenders, and over half of our salamanders are lungless. So 100% of their oxygen in, and 100% of their CO2 out, is through their skin, no lungs. So the majority of the uh, salamanders in the world have no lungs, okay? Now let's talk about diet. Switch off from the skin, just to talk about what they eat. Larvae, okay, before they're adults, okay, mainly when they're in water, but not all larvae are in water, they're more of them are filter feeders, and you can see by the mouth of these tadpoles. So they filter feed all the suspension algae and plankton in the water. 
okay? They can also nibble algal growth and feed on plants. Now there are some, like our barred tiger salamander larvae, that are omnivorous, which means they will eat insects, small fish, small shrimp, as well as vegetation. But the majority of all the frogs in Nebraska, they're filter feeders. There's only one that's omnivorous, that's the spade foot. All the rest are um, um, herbivores or filter feeders. The only two omnivores that eat, that eat some other animals, whether they're worms or fish, are the bar tiger salamander and the spade foot in Nebraska. Now as adults, they all are what we call auditory carnivores. They can't digest any carbohydrates. Their, their digestive system cannot do it. So you can't ever have a vegan amphibian once it hits the adult stage, it would die. You can give it as much protein, plant protein as you want, it can't assimilate it, it's a dead animal, okay? So all amphibians have to have have to be carnivores and so to speak eat protein and eat that protein through some kind of meat whether it's insect meat worm meat fish meat slug meat it doesn't matter all adult amphibians are auditory carnivores and you can see yes this is a tree frog that swallowed a lightning bug uh, it's not ET, and I just thought this was great, and um, this isn't my picture. I got this picture from someone else, but I have seen this happen once, um, but I wasn't able to catch it on film, so, um, or digitally. But yes, that's a tree frog who ate a lightning bug. And they do feed on things fairly good size. Their stomach doesn't digest. Their stomach is a holding pouch. So here the, here's a green tree frog eating a big cricket, here's a salamander eating a roach, and here is a invasive bullfrog eating a starling. Yes, they will eat anything they can fit in their stomach. Now let's talk about breeding because most of the stuff that we're going to be doing and talking about monitoring happens during breeding season. When do amphibians breed? What's the time? Well, in Nebraska, in the temperate zone, it's hinged to two things, temperature and the availability of water and humidity. So we're talking about temperature just above freezing. Here's salamanders on ice. Okay, it's a Disney movie, no. Um, long as they don't freeze, they actually have their bodies go to 0.5 degrees below zero centigrade or negative 0.5 centigrade okay and still be alive okay they can't go much below that so if the water is still liquid no matter how cold it is they're okay with that and they can travel as long as they're wet and have mucus on their body that doesn't freeze they can travel on snow or ice as you can see right here, they are doing that. So I was out two weeks ago when we had a rainy night in Nemaha County traveling the road, road nights because they're going to move when it's a rainy night because they have to stay wet. And our smallmouth salamanders were starting to move in Nemaha County, one of the only counties they're in. They were starting to move from there where they spent the winter to the temporary bodies of water where they're probably in the midst of already developing their eggs. Their eggs are probably already into tiny little larvae by now, because it only, only takes a week. So the, the triggers are big rains that cause vernal ponds, which means springtime ponds, wet nights, okay, to get them to move to those areas, and then temperatures above freezing at night. We don't really care about the daytime temperatures. We want above freezing at night. Where? I kind of alluded to this. Well, there's a few, uh, only one in Nebraska, uh, possibly three, 
that can reproduce in permanent bodies of water. And that would be the invasive bullfrog and our two leopard frogs. Okay, they may use and have a tendency to use permanent waters. The leopard frogs rather be vernal, but if they can find a pocket off of a permanent lake, they'll take advantage of that. Because uh, we never used to have permanent lakes, but we dammed everything in eastern Nebraska and caused permanent water. So they, they do use those. What all amphibians in Nebraska prefer is what we call temporary or vernal bodies of water. Some want bodies of water that will last till June. Some want bodies of water that will last to July. Some want bodies of water that may stay a year but dry up every other year. And others use bodies of water that may only be there for 30 to 45 days. Things like spadefoots or the Great Plains toads. They will reproduce after a thunderstorm. Find a ditch, get there, call, mate, lay eggs, and those eggs will try to turn into little tiny adults within 30 days before that ditch dries up. We call them explosive reproducers. And we have them right here in Nebraska. And then there is, not in Nebraska, but there's many amphibians that actually uh, make pockets of water in the rocks or in plants in the tropics and will have their eggs and their tadpole stage or larval stage outside of water, out of water but in a wet situation. And there's some really weird situations which I don't have time to get into. Okay, let's talk about salamander courtship. It's very different, especially for those here in Nebraska. They don't get together. They may follow each other, but the male leaves a little packet, we call this spermatophor, and then the female finds that packet, picks it up, inseminates herself, and then goes into the pond and lays eggs. So the male, and I'll talk about the western barred tiger, leaves about 30 packets in about three nights time right at the edge of ponds and then the female will come out at night search for those pond packets or spermatophores they're hard to find if you're really good you can find them you can see how small they are and she'll pick them up with her coaxial opening and inseminate herself and then lay eggs so for our salamanders, our two salamanders, there is no mating. They don't, they, don't, they don't have to see each other to have young together, okay? Some salamanders, they do courtships where they do dances and follow each other as these two um, Cumberland Gap salamanders are. Now, we do have aquatic salamanders in other parts of the United States that do kind of curl together and exchange the spermatophore. And then anurans, or frogs, will do a thing called amplexus, where they hang together for almost a day, and then the female will push the eggs out, and the male will inseminate them, and then the gel will form, form over them. And you will see this happening in ponds fairly quickly, and it's already happening with chorus frogs in this part of the state. And the result is this. It's embryos in a gel. Now this gel is really complicated. It has seven layers. All, um, and it, there's like 12 different functions of this polysaccharide protein glutenatinous material. But it, it's amazing. It's amazing stuff. That, the, that which we just looked at were leopard frog eggs. These are um, Great Plains toad eggs. These are American toad eggs. Now our salamanders leave them in small packets like this. Kind of like our cricket frogs. Our chorus frogs leave, leave them in balls, almost like the leopard frog. Uh, but our cricket frogs leave little six packs and our salamanders leave little six packs of eggs on uh, vegetation sunk down. Then, 
uh, in time, they will turn, in a very short time, if the temperature's right, you'll get all these little tadpoles. These are uh, Woodhouse toads that just little Thomas. Here we have a leopard frog. And here is our bar tiger salamander larvae. And here is a smallmouth salamander larvae in the lab. This is very small. This is less than three quarters of an inch from here to here. And these will grow quite big, up to six inches. So they start off really small. And so just showing you, how do you tell the difference between a frog tadpole and a salamander tadpole? Really easy. All caudata, the order caudata larvae, have external gills, three on each side, and four appendages. Okay? These, these little appendages there, you can hardly see them, but they're there. All anurin, or frog tadpoles, have internal gills. Well, 90% of them have internal gill. There's a couple by the still in the, when they're still in the gel, they have ex external, and we have, there's a couple of species with external. But all the ones in Nebraska, once they come out of the gel, they have internal gills and no legs until their later stages, and then they pop out with the back legs first, and then within a week before transforming, they pop out their front legs. Now, real quickly, I had a student here last October. One of my students is now getting his master's with Mike Forsberg, um, uh, working on photography for conservation. Uh, actually did one of our salamanders transforming. So let me get that up for you. Minimize this. Go to Where to go, Allie? We'll have to get it back. We'll get it back. Just hold on for a second. Take a break. Anybody has any questions while I'm trying to reload this video? I'd be happy to answer. Allie, if anybody has any questions? Sure, if you can multitask. Caroline Smith wanted to know um, if salamanders can eat live or dead mealworms. Yes, um, they will eat them. The dead ones, you'll have to wiggle. Uh, amphibians mainly only see things that move. They can't recognize things that don't move. It's not food unless it moves. So you'll have to uh, make it move. Okay, so here we go. I got to share the screen. You see the screen with a video in it yet? No, right now we see the PowerPoint slideshow. Oh, you do? Okay. How's that? You got it. Okay, let me oops, come on back 
I gotta go to so you get the, the sound. There we go. Is it working fine, Allie? Yeah, it's working. So there it was. Late stages. Starting to change, get color, gills are shrinking, this happens quick. Legs are getting more robust, gills are getting smaller, tail is changing, gills are getting even smaller, tail is really changing, and bingo, within 24 hours, you have the salamander. Dennis, can you clarify that 24-hour time frame, please? Well, it, it's very dependent. Let me stop this. So you're seeing me now, right? Okay. Correct. So the timing is very temperature dependent. And so I can keep in the larvae stage if I put chillers on the tank for like two years. So it depends on the temperature how fast. Okay, so the problem we had is we wanted them chained so we can film them. So we slowly were raising the temperature up a half degree centigrade, and it wasn't changing, it wasn't changing. Then we hit a point where it went and it changed in two days. So But from the stage that it was originally at, not from hatching to full right. perfect. So you didn't when you started looking at them, they were already four months old. Okay. So they just grew from that big to that big in four months. So they grow in the larval stage to a point and then they go through metamorphosis. Now, if the pond starts drying up, they'll metamorphose only this big. Or if there's a lot of food in the pond and it's not crowded, they'll overwinter in the pond and grow this big before metamorphosis. It's all depending on the environmental cues. They're very plastic or flexible. They'll do what it takes at any time. And because we know what triggers it, and actually there's a chemical we can make it triggering faster, a growth hormone. So if we throw the growth hormone in there, they'll change within 48 hours if we want them to at any temperature. We, kinda, we, we trick Mother Nature sometimes for our, for our experimentation. Okay. So let me bring this back. Let me share the PowerPoint again. Okay. So you should be seeing. Now I'm going to talk about. Um, why they're important in the whole ecosystem. They're an important part of the food web. They're a nutrient sink, which means they bring nutrients from the aquatic situation to the terrestrial situation, and they also bring nutrients and nitrates, phosphates, from the terrestrial situation and environment to the aquatic. One of the few specimens that crosses that line, and that makes them, for an ecosystem, engineer that makes them just huh, fantastic um, there's a large abundance of them there are strategists so when they have larvae they don't have them by the dozens but they have them by the thousands um, and and they are available in most ecosystems some type of amphibian is in most ecosystems except there's only a few in desert type ecosystems or frozen ecosystems and they're an intermediate predator which means they eat a lot of things and a lot of things eat them. So here you see a bullfrog eating a uh, water snake and here is a bird eating the bullfrog. Um, of course, most of them are eating things like insects. 
like we talked about, um, but they're important. The other thing is, they're, because of this semi permeable membrane for skin and the fact that they play this big role in an ecosystem, they're affected, their whole population is affected by a lot of things that we do. And there's a whole list. Everything to how we change the habitat, agriculture, urbanization, even grazing, suppression of fire, recreational development, roads, our manipulation with water, okay? Of course, exotic species, environmental contaminants, UVB affects them. Because you gotta remember, their embryos are developing as they float on the water. So their embryos are getting contaminants from the water. Their embryos are getting contaminants from the air. Their embryos are being bombarded by UVB. And so they're tetragenic. And so they, a change in the, the atmosphere. And of course there is collecting and harvesting, which isn't as bad as a problem because they are our strategists. Because of all this, there are what we call bioindicators or an indicator species. Because of their amphibious life, that permeable coating on their eggs, the semi-permeable skin, the fact they breathe through their skin, they absorb all toxicants through their skin, okay? And they are massive insect feeders. So if an insect gets a little bit of chemical but doesn't die, what we call biomagnification occurs it builds up in their body. So if an insect has one part per million of a, of a contaminant in its body, because it's very small, well, that frog is gonna eat 100 insects a night. So it's gonna get one part per 100 of that contaminant in its body. That's biomagnification. And that could be lethal, or at least cause a problem. And so all these things um, cause problems, which also causes their body and their immune system to crash. And so then we see this stress of all these contaminants and other things causing diseases and malformities. And I'll talk a little bit about those we have time. Okay, I want to get into, because I'm starting to get low here on uh, time, um, amphibians in Nebraska. So this is our list of our two salamanders, our 11 frogs and toads, and we possibly can have 12. I have heard, but not captured, and so has Dan Fogel. We're the only two herpetologists in the state, really, uh, um, that work in the state and have been for years. Um, I think he's board certified. I know I'm board certified, but I think we're the only two board certified field herpetologists. Well, I know we are, because I know Travis is in my Okay, so these are the 11 uh, frogs and toads, and one is invasive. That's the American bullfrog. It is not native to the state of Nebraska. We have the data now to indicate that. So we're going to talk mainly about salamanders. So one of our salamanders is a smallmouth salamander, Ambisostoma taxanum. This is doing fairly well but it only enters the state in the extreme southeast corner. I have found them as far north as Sarpy County, but they're rare in Sarpy County. Um, but in Nemaha County, Richardson County, um, they, I can find them every year in the last five years. And so they're secretive, but they're there and they're doing okay. But they ba barely get into the state. They're really small and they're very secretive. They only come above ground right now, and that's it. Then there's the Western Bar Tiger Salamander, Ambisostoma marvonium. And I just want to say something. All these are Western Bar Tigers. These two, some people would say, oh, this is Bar, this is Blotch. These two came from the same egg mass. These are brothers or sisters or brother and sister they have the same parents there's a great amount of genetic variety we don't call someone who has blonde hair and the brother who has 
not blonde hair, two different species. Let's not call these salamanders two species just because they look different. It's genetic. It's genetic variability. So right now we're doing alleles to make sure they're all in this Marvonium. And all these are Marvonium. And all these are from Nebraska. And they're all rovers, where they should be across the whole state. So what's the status? Well, in all the data I've been capturing, we don't have any amphibian in decline over a five year period or more, okay? We do have ebbs and flows, that's the way amphibians are, on some. We have some gaining, some declining a little in some areas. But the only one that has massive decline in a large area is the western bar tiger salamander, one of our two salamanders. And so that's the one we're doing a lot of work on. We want to know where it's declining, why it's declining, and how can we stop it from declining. So for the last 10 years, we're in a multifaceted project. In the one in the, the ones in the green, in the last 10 years, we have developed them. We published our landscape genetics of them already. We published our disease stuff. Um, we're, of course, still looking at these others. But the big one we need help with is why everybody hopefully is on this Zoom educational platform is that we need current occupancy estimates. So over the last seven years, we've been doing a lot of work. And this is just looking at our data. This is our, if you just kind of ring it out here, we have no problem. I can get 50 a night. This is kind of highway 40. This is an area we've been searching for seven years. We have not caught any. We have no confirmed, not genetically. We got a couple. Those couple were released bait shop entities, okay? Which we can tell that now right away with DNA. This area, I don't know where this line is. I just know this is the line where the data stops. And I know this is the line where that I, they're okay. This whole area here is data lacking. And this is highway uh, 15. And Highway 81 goes here, which is our focus area this year. Highway 15 to Highway 81, which is True York. But this is our big data lacking area. Now, trapping is one way, um, but because of permits and everything, um, it's a bit difficult and you have to be there 20, within 6 to 12 hours. Um, and so what we do is netting and saning. This is just some of our data that we do every year. And the reason why we still do it out west is to check our methodology, to make sure our methodology is working. So we need help amphibian monitoring on these creatures. We need data. And so at my website, you can put data in. We'll send you if you want. You can email me and uh, starting next week, because I leave tomorrow morning for the sand hills because rattlesnakes will be coming out and I'm meeting Andy Holy Cross and all these people from California to put transmitters in rattlesnakes. That's my weekend. Can't wait. One of the happiest times of the year. Um, but on Monday, uh, you can start emailing me and I'll uh, email you back because I'll have to make this form. But you can put it in. Uh, Allie has a form up on our site. We're not using iNaturalist because I always had I've had problem with iNaturalist, and actually there's been two now referee journal articles that came out in the Journal of Herpetology about how iNaturalist is causing massive um, kill off of animals because people go on that and they want to see they want to keep those animals, especially herps, and they go out there and they rape the countryside. So I will stay off of Facebook and iNaturalist because it's causing a great decline and theft of our natural herbivora. And so we have to stay off those, those websites, I'm sorry. And so when you put it in this website, no one else can see it but me, okay? 
and I share it with Damon Parks. We have to keep where these things are a secret, unfortunately, or everybody will be out there wanting them in their pe as pets. And there's, just, and there's been some massive publications showing that too many people want snakes and turtles and frogs. And this eye naturalist thing we thought was great, it's not for herps. It, it, it's causing great angst for all of us. There's too many dishonest people out there. So, but we want the honest help, which is you guys. So, when you first go out, this is the data we need recorded. Time of day, location, county, and GPS whatever you have on your phone look up how cloudy is it how much moonlight is it at night what's the wind like is it calm is it windy is it a slight wind I don't need a meter just tell me that air temperature you can get that usually on your phone or if you want you can borrow some temperature devices we usually want ground temperature or temperature just off the ground what's the relative humidity you can look at you know you can look on Google Earth and get that um, and then water temperature, throw a thermometer in the water, or soil temperature, stick the thermometer in the soil. And what is the vegetation? Is it sandy? Is it grass? Is it woodland? Just simple environmental conditions. We don't need it really scientific, but we do want this, these items. Then we can do different types of searches. We can go across near standing water at night with searchlights, remember, do not shine your lights if there's any cars coming your way. Okay, you want out of the way roads um, because usually roads are well traveled, the animals are going to be squished, and that genetic group is already gone. So, less traveled roads, rainy nights. Um, and just to show you, this act of searching for salamanders is only about 33%. You know, it's better for frogs, it's okay for turtles, and lizards and snakes, it's not as good. But we're talking about salamanders, so our active search or detection probability is not very high. Safety first, if there's any other cars, pull over, put your flashers on. Otherwise, put your brights on, look down at the road. Go slow, go really slow. Okay, and then if you see it, take a picture of it with the light. Preferably throw a ruler down, take a picture of it. That's all you have to do. And maybe scoot it off the road in the direction it was going. We don't want you to take them, and then you can record that other information. And you also, for your safety, um, always wear reflective clothing and a headlamp. If you have a headlamp that in the back has a red light that flashes, that's even better for safety. Okay, if you're going to touch these to scoot them off the road or to take a picture, they have that semi permeable membrane, no lotions, no sunscreen, no bug sprays, no nicotine. And vaping is worse than, than just smoking on your fingers because it's nicotine in water. That'll kill amphibians faster than anything. So I would say you want uh, some kind of gloves, nitrile is best, or plastic gloves that are rinsed, and caffeine. Caffeine, if you just had a drink of coffee and that touches that amphibian, it's a goner. That's all it takes. Holding very gently don't squeeze too hard remember they are slimy so hold them somewhat firmly and this is by for taking them out of the net don't kick them out of the net don't grab them by their tail or gills and then gently take a picture and return them you can use dip nets but dip nets are difficult for salamanders usually because the ponds are wider, but we, w I do have some dip nets that um, you can uh, rent. Primarily, we want sanes, and uh, while I am, I'm going to stop sharing 
this video and bring up a video that I made, that the same student made on how to sing. While I'm doing that, Ali, why don't you share on the regulations for singing in the state of Nebraska? Sure, thanks, Dennis. Okay, so um, when we were revamping the protocols on how to do do these surveys and decided we were going to try seining this year um, for community scientists, we had to think about the permits involved with um, collecting species. Um, so I worked with Sean Dunn, who does the collection permits for the state, and we came to the conclusion that if you do want to participate in this project, you will be able to with just a fishing license. So the fishing license will cover the seining um, on state lands and private lands with permission. Um, we are working to get permission to also go on some of those fish and wildlife lands within the rainwater basin as well. Um, but right now we're focusing on um, some state lands. Our conservation officers in the area have been um, alerted that there will be community scientists going out and seining for amphibians. Um, and so they should be aware of it. But if you have any issues, feel free to contact, contact me. I don't think you will, but if there's any other questions, just let me know. Um, and then it is important to note that uh, the fishing regulations for the state do outline some areas where seining uh, is not allowed. This mostly covers um, permanent lake areas. Um, which isn't really where we're going to be looking for this project, so we shouldn't need to worry about that. Um, but just a couple notes when you are visiting public lands, um, think about things like, do you need a park permit? Is it hunting season? Um, just thinking about those safety things. Another thing Sean um, mentioned earlier today, Dennis, and you can weigh in on this, is the possibility of seining along roadside ditches that might have that permit or not permanent but semi-permanent water um if if that would be something we would want them to do as well we can easily do that but um a lot of people don't realize this and i got a permit and i'm pretty sure dan does too but to even for cover boards or look for snakes on roadsides you need permission from the department of roads they have a okay. biologist and so i'll look into that and most of the time there's no big problem if you do it um, but legally you're not supposed to do anything um, in those roadside ditches without permission from the department of roads i have to get permission for cover boards there and i usually tell their bio well the blanket permit from the bio from the department of roads for doing saning in roadside ditches but it's a good place it's an excellent place Okay, um, so Sean also put together this site of WMA sites within that target area that Dennis spoke of earlier. So here's a list of some sites that we might wanna focus on this year. Um, if you have any questions about location or regulations, or um, if you would like to survey at one of these sites, if you could just shoot me an email and let me know. I'm gonna throw it back to you, Dennis. Okay, I just wanna say one thing um, that you, um that if you have a saying in your truck or car and you go on a state park land where you can't sane, you still can get a ticket because you have method of capture. So do not take a saying into a state park that you're not allowed to sane in. Because I had a student who didn't take the university vehicle, he was doing turtle work and he had a turtle net in his truck and he went on into a State Park and he got a ticket because he had a turtle net just in the back of the truck because that's method of take. And so the law says you cannot even have method of take in your possession and go to the state park. Yeah, so if you have any questions in that regard, just shoot me an email and we will get it figured out for you. We want to make sure you're comfortable going out to sites. So definitely this list right here are approved sites you won't have a problem going out to. Okay. So let's learn how to say now.
the only water Hair is okay. from the windmills. They were in prairie dog towns. So in wet years, bison would wallow in prairie dog towns. That would compact okay. the soil. That area would hold water all the way up to August. And that's where the salamanders, they reproduce and overwinter sometimes. Prairie dogs are a keystone species, environmental engineer, that the salamanders need to rely on. Prairie dog towns, if there was enough of them, would be the best because you have a place to reproduce, a place to excavate, and a place to hibernate, all within their easy range. We have not found them moving more than a mile radius. Without prairie dogs, they have taken over to utilize these ponds that are formed by the overflow of the cattle tanks. It now becomes the androgenic buffalo wallow. And the salamanders and the spadefoot toads and the woodhouse toads and the great plain toads utilize that as a vernal pond for reproduction. So right now we're getting the parameters, which is we're actually where we're at, GPS. We're getting wind speed, temperature, and relative humidity at one meter above the ground, because herbs are always close to the ground, and the temperature, um, wind speed, and looms very close to the ground level, within 10 centimeters of the ground level. And we'll also take water temperature. Now, this is a 12-footer, and it's a eighth of an inch to get us tadpole. Again, I stopped. My lead line is at the bottom. So I want you to put it right at the edge at a 45 degree angle. Okay, like this. You're gonna hold one hand down here with the net and one hand up here with the net. This is a shallow pond. Okay, so we're gonna drag this on the bottom and kind of like keep it in the mud and keep it taut. So keep, try to pull me in the water. And I'll try to pull you in the water but we want to have a loop on it. So we want to stay, kind of go the same. The weeds are going to cause a little bit of problem for us. Hopefully not too much. Keep our lead line down and our, keep this one up. Don't, you're getting ahead of me. Slow down a little. I got a longer way to go here. Okay, when we get close, watch out Ruby. We're going to go faster and then you're going to sit it up and we want to sit it up real quick with the bottom coming up first. So right now, sit her up and pull. Pull! Pull, pull more, no way, pull more on you. They're transforming because they have to get out of here because this will freeze solid. Normally they have gills. This was done in October. There you go, what is it? 60. 60? Okay, you just spread your float line out. And throw Remember, of course, I sterilize these when we get back to the lab after each location so we don't transmit any amphibian diseases between. So you always you go in two locations, you need to spray this down with a very weak solution of antibacterium and then rinse, rinse, rinse. Usually I do that from a tank because you don't want to transfer any amphibian bacterium or diseases from pond to pond. Again, 45. Keeping that. Oh, one just went over, something went over. Okay, one, two, three, scoop up. Four, three, five. Thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine. One hundred. Get more than ten. We got over a hundred in that load, so uh,
So that's staining. Um, and again, let me share my other screen and keep on going here. You see the other screen now? Yes. So this, the, the, we use one eighth of an inch, so we can even get the small larvae, and you can get the eight, 10, 12, 15. And if you're just starting off, I would say a 10 or 12 uh, length to, uh, to do. And the, the traps, now, you can buy these yourself, or um, I have several of them that I'm willing to rent out. There'll be a twenty-five to fifty-dollar deposit, depending on how much, how many you, you know, whether you want a stain, a dip net, plus some equipment, and maybe fifty-dollar deposit. You will get the whole deposit back when you bring back the item with the data. If you just bring back the item back and not the data, I won't give you the money back. That's one way I'll make sure I get my money, or I get the data. Excuse me. I probably will need a two weeks notice. For you to come pick up and return or pick up and i want to clean and clean in between one thing i didn't mention in the video you need to clean your clothing or your 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 waders if you use waders unless i'm breaking through ice i don't use waders as long as it, i'm not breaking the ice i'll go i'll go cold water um and um but you if you want to use uh, waders, they need to be, you know, a real weak solution of Clorox and then rinse, 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 quadruple rinsing um, is the best way. Or spray down the same with 1% Clorox and then rinse, 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 rinse in between. That's so you don't transfer stuff. Okay, just to, real quickly, and then I'll start answering questions. And then, we're still working on other stuff. Um, the stuff in the green we worked on, like I said, we published landscape genetics um, and we did a lot with diseases just to show you how small they are. So this is how big they are, will be until uh, they're about three weeks. So I would say until mid-May, they're gonna be that big, this big. And then by end of May, beginning of June, they may get to be one of these two here and then up a little more. So they're pretty small. And this is just when we were doing hundreds of them in the lab and we start moving to bigger tanks. So usually you catch them when they're about this size. And so you'll, we'll start finding this size. So, we say you can start saining next week. So what you're going to find is the adults going in there to wait around to put out the males to put out their spermatophores or the females to pick up those. So that's why we definitely don't want you to take them if you find them. But you will find adults right now. Well, yeah, I, I, I think you should find adults right now. And that window we said, Dennis, was April to June. We want saning for those adults, correct? And then after June, you'll start getting these guys, the larvae. And you can get a mix of the small larvae, and here they are just transforming in the lab. And again, this is that two siblings here. And I just want to say we tested about every of them for chytrid. They are coming positive, but they don't show the signs of chytrid because even the ones on the edge, because it's not manifested itself in Nebraska. So kitchen is not a problem in Nebraska. It's here, it's not a problem. And so Jake Kirby from South Dakota and I have come up with that thing. So just in case, and if you do want to test for kitchen, I have all the kits because I have thousands of them. Um, I won't run them because um, to run a hundred costs me a little bit, and I don't see a need to, but I can hold the Kitra test for years and years and years. And I have over a thousand tests from across the state. But if you want a couple of Kitra test uh, kits, I'll give you those for free. And you can just swab them, you just swab their body. These are the signs of Kitra on salamanders right there, not from Nebraska. These are spotted salamanders from the East Coast. 
And this is just a behavioral test for chytrid, if they actually, not if they have it, because they can have it without any symptoms, but if they have the symptoms. If they, if they actually have the disease, they're not just carrying disease like almost all of them do. Um, touch their eyes, uh, they'll blink. If they don't blink, that could be a problem. You flip them over, they don't flip back. And if you hold their mouth, if they don't try to get your fingers off their mouth. And again, I can supply you with this material. And again, the best places are here. Between the toes, on the side of the body, and then the pelvic patch if you're doing a frog. Okay, and then if anybody wants to do frog call stuff, we can talk about that later. But that's the end of what I have. Okay, so one one thing I wanted to um, bring up, Dennis, I didn't, I don't remember you saying this, was once you have caught the salamanders, we'd like you to take a picture of them and preferably have a ruler next to the salamander in the photo so that we can um, see how big it is. I so. I thought I said that, but I was going to make a slide and I didn't, but. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that information from the data sheets that will get to you, and then those photos will be uploaded um, through the UNL herpetology site, which I can throw the link to that in the chat. Yeah, and, and it's also in the PowerPoint. Um, it's just HerbNet. But I, I think, Allie, when we did it last year, or the year before in 19, because we couldn't do it last year, um, we have that data as lines in the website. If you go to Salamander, it has all it has places where they can put that data in. Yeah, so we so we have it under this reporting page is where we put it. Um, right. So, so you, that link is right there. So those lines that are you fill out on the data sheet could just go straight into the site, and it would be one per Salamander. Right. Okay, we do have some questions. Um, sure. <laughs> Allison asked if salamanders die after reproduction. No, the Western bar tiger salamander lives 25 to 30 years. So if I, if I metamorphose one this year, it'll outlive me easily. I'm already 65. It'll, it won't be, it'll be hardly sexually mature before I die. <laughs> All right, um, Anthony wanted to know what, what's in the tanks behind you, Dennis? Oh, it's a long story. <laughs> so, so this room, I'm actually, this is my lab, it's a whole building, and there's five rooms. Primarily we have a gender pair of all the snakes, all the amphibians, all the turtles, and we're, we let go most of the lizards because of COVID, didn't have the students, we're building that back up. But this tank behind me, uh, this is a 250 gallon tank, has a one year old baby alligator that hatched out February 25th. It's a long story that it, it was COVID related, but he'll be Just going a COVID alligator, no big deal. Yes, yeah, he doesn't have COVID, but I had, um, it, yeah. I took on a project that students were supposed to do on a bunch of eggs that hatched on February 25th. On March 25th, we locked down and they, all the students had to go home. And I was stuck with 17 baby alligators going, what am I gonna do? <laughs> so I grew them up and they went to zoos and wildlife encounters. Um, this one will probably go to Lincoln Children's Zoo. This is one last one. All right, um, Caroline asked if amphibians are eating toxins within their environment, do they pass them on to their offspring? If the to toxin is tetragenic, so it all depends on, so it, it depends on the toxin. They can, the females especially. The males, we don't know exactly. But it, the thing is, if it's a toxicant that can mutate the genetic material, then they may not be passing on the exact toxicin, but they're passing on a effect of the toxicin. All right, Pete asked, or he said, um, 
He lives in Northwest Omaha. Friends and neighbors have small pools or ponds in their yards and sometimes frogs show up. He's asking, where do those frogs come from? Well, during rainy nights, frogs will travel, depends on the species. And it's usually the smaller ones that travel farther. Leopard frogs are noted to travel easily a mile during rainy nights. And toads, uh, American, uh, Woodhouse toads or American toads, or you're in Northwest Douglas County. Northwest Douglas County would have Woodhouse toads, not American. Southwest would have American. Anyway, <laughs> they will be buried down in sandy areas that may not have a lot of moisture, but have hydric soil. And during rainy nights, they come out and they will travel to these ponds. And they may stay there to the next rainy night. All right, we have another question. Can salamanders stay with their gills or aquatic their entire lifetime? That's called neonautics. And we do have some neonautics um, in the sandhills of Nebraska. And we have what we call pediomorphs. I didn't get into that. Pediomorphs are neotenics that actually get the ability to reproduce in the larval stage. Very complicated, very cool. It's called, uh, and then they go through inclusive fitness theory. Uh, but that's a whole lecture. Take herpetology from me. I teach three classes now. Field herp, advanced herp, and regular herp. And they fill up. My field herp for this summer filled up in four days. I can't believe it. Okay, um, Aaron asks if we should be concerned with bait shops selling salamanders a, a, as bait. Are they required to be local? Yes, for the most part. Um, Game of Parks, they have to go through Game of Parks, uh, the bait dealer does. And we okay certain stocks. Most of the bait dealers on the other side, on west of Highway 81, are getting them from a Valentine Hatchery, which does fish and also does the salamanders. So they're native. Some of the bait shops this side, east of 81, are getting them from Rutenville, Minnesota, um, which are, we, when we test them, they're coming out as marvonium uh, so we're not too worried about it but we're not finding that that even those alive with their with the we can know what those alleles are and they look a little different they're not making it in this part of the state if they get off the hook because we we're not finding any in our traps for seven to ten years you know none <laughs> so Whatever is getting rid of our natives is not letting these imported ones live either. So we don't, and we have some, we have some data now that it's pointing towards something. I can't talk about it yet until I get it published because it's something I know I'm going to be, when I first publish it, I'm going to be sued. But I've been sued by chemical companies before and I sue them back and I win, so I don't mind. It's what I do. Dennis, um, I was answering another question in the chat, but so I think you might have touched on this, but um, can you talk a little bit about why numbers are declining now? Well, that's what we're trying to figure out. Yeah, we don't know exactly. We know so far there's three or four things we're looking at. And I wish I knew, but that's the question that you see behind me is just a small spattering of the of the research papers. There's two rows around this whole building. And you're only seeing about one eighth of the wall. And half of these half of these studies are, are with the salamanders. Everything from pH to nitrates to fungicides to pesticides, you name it. And so we're, we're, it, it takes a long time to get the data and run these experiments. So, 
Yeah, so Allison asked um, what the dates of the surveys are again. So for, from April to June, we're asking people to sign for mostly the adults or the ones that have overwintered. Um, and then if you want to continue signing after that, it sounded like that would be okay. But then we would like another larger effort, um, September to October. So those would be those um, young that haven't left the pool yet, but they're more sizable and easier to identify. So those would be the two main windows and I'll put that in the chat. And then another thing I wanted to um, touch on, Dennis, um, so seining is maybe difficult or maybe it seems a little overwhelming to just see online. Um, we are going to try to have a field day in a couple of weeks. Um, so if people are feeling comfortable at that point to get out in the field um, and try this and learn a little bit more at that point, I'll send out an email to everybody who registered for the workshop once we get that figured out. How about this, just real quickly, if you want to say in it have to be a Saturday or Sunday in about two weeks, um, get together for a little on site, just hit reactions and, and put a hand up just real quickly if you definitely want to, just so I get a kind of feel if it's worth just line up something. Too many. Oh, we got Dan there. Okay, that's that's just what I wanted to see. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, great. Um, so I do have a quick evaluation. Um, I'll throw the link out in the chat and then I'll also send it out again um, with the recording when I send that out as well. Um, so any feedback you can give us is really appreciated. It just helps us to be able to improve our program and know um, maybe what information we're missing or what would help you feel more comfortable when you get out into the field. Um, Allison said she would love to, but she's way out in Bassett. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll be in Brown County in that way. I know Bassett's not in Brown, but I'll be at Niagara Preserve this weekend and I go out there a lot and cross the state. So um, if you want, Allison, put your contact in. You, you may get a private lesson when I'm out there saying, also, um, somebody asked if I would send out the um, list of sites that I showed earlier, and I can send that out when I send out the recording as well. Um, another question, I live in the blue area, any area there of particular interest? Yeah, um, we always want more in that area where we haven't found any. So Johnson County is one that we need more. And um, if you want to contact me and even if it's, you know, a farm pond on your own property, you can check it every six hours or set it before nightfall and pick it up right at dawn. Um, I'll give you some traps. If you own the pond, you know, no one else is going out there and you can check it. You know, you don't have to go out every day. Just if you set it, you have to go out the next morning at sunrise. Okay, I think you, you combined it, Dan and Carolyn's question there. Carolyn sent it to me as a direct message. Um, so she just said she lives in the blue area from the map earlier. Is there any particular interest of that within that area? Well, the, the blue area, I'm trying to remember which one's blue and which. Blue was your target area, it was the middle one. Okay, so the whole target area, but we're, we're focusing right now because the target, the whole blue area goes from about 15 to 40, the, the whole distance of the state. 
but for this year we're focusing on 15 to 81 south of 80. That doesn't mean we don't want data from other places. It just means we would really love to get more data from that. Right. So if you're above 80 and over on the other side of 81, Carolyn, that's per that's a fine. Any data is great. There's no such thing as bad data. And with so, that note, we also want to know where you aren't finding them. Yeah, so just because you don't find them doesn't mean we don't want to know about your effort. Yeah, we want to know about your efforts. So you put that in there just that you put zero found. Because that's just as important. So there's no, I mean, I have master naturalists that have been putting traps out now for five years and haven't found a thing. A hundred nights. And that's, you know, I'm indebted to them. They're kind of depressed because they haven't found it. And I'm going, that's okay. That's what this is all about. So, the, so to speak, the only bad data is when you don't collect it. Um, Kathleen asked about Webster County. Yeah, that's fine. That's a good place. Okay, I think we'll stop there. Um, if anybody has questions about particular areas, you can reach out to Dennis or I directly. I can throw my email in the chat again. And remember that website, besides having that in there, it has all uh, my fraud calls are on there. Um, I think it was, was it, you say it was Kathleen in Webster County. Webster's one of two counties where the narrow mouth toad is. You no, know, you you definitely know when you hear them. They'll be calling in about four or five days. I mean, excuse me, four or five weeks. It sounds like an old man vomiting. Blah, blah. And but the, the actual calls are on my CD. So if you don't have my CD, it, the, all the calls are on my website. Listen to it and then see if you hear it. Dennis, I still desperately want a copy of your CD. Not many left. We sold out. It didn't go platinum. It went, it went green. It's a frog call CD. Okay. Uh, we did have a question from Anthony really quick. Are those frog calls different from the ones found on Frog Watch USA? Yes. They're Nebraska dialect. That's why I don't like Frog Watch USA. <laughs> Is they have different we have different dialects we have all, so all the ones on my website which are the same ones in here I record it in Nebraska so the frog watch USA is out, out of this uh, I think out of Maryland yeah University of Maryland so they have that eastern kind of uh, dialect yo Okay. Well, thank, thank you everyone for coming tonight. If you have questions after the fact, just um, let us know. We're happy to help in any way you can. Like I said, if you have questions about locations or permits, let me know. Um, I'll help you get squared away. And if you have questions about equipment, I would reach out to um, Dennis for those. Okay. Nothing else. Thank you. Good evening.